me moderate comments and questions and things. And my dog Harvey is here too, trotting around. If you follow me on Instagram, you probably know him from my Instagram stories. He totally thinks he's my little sous chef. He hangs out next to me all the time when I'm cooking. If you're not following me on Instagram, it's at cookingwjulie. So definitely jump on there and say hi. So what I'm gonna do is step us through. You can see I've got a whole ton of stuff out on this island. I thought this was a big island and I just realized it's really not. Um, I've got all of the fixings for all of, of most of the classic dishes that many people enjoy on Thanksgiving. But since this Thanksgiving might be a little bit more scaled down for many of us, I figured I would talk a lot about ways to make smaller amounts of classic dishes. And since we're known as where happy meets healthy, we're all about making things lightened up but in a fun loving flavorful way so uh for people that don't really know me that well i've been the main weight watchers recipe developer for about 10 years now so if you see me post things and i'm talking about smart points or sp i'll mention that today but we're going to have a mix of weight watchers members and non-members smart points or sp is really just the weight watchers way of calculating calories and fat basically tracking how much you're eating so anytime i say something like this will slash smart points for everyone else at home who's not following Weight Watchers. It pretty much just means, oh, it's a way of making it healthier. But I promise I'm really, really good at. And one of my favorite things to do is to come up with ways to make food healthier and lighter without compromising on flavor or taste. So let's dig right in. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to be covering and then we're going to go for it. And if we can, let's keep questions to the end just so that I don't get too off track. For people that know me personally, I'm really chatty. We could wind up here for a really long time. So grab a piece of paper and a pen and a glass of wine or some tea and let's have a good time today. So we're gonna cover options for turkey. Turkey is kind of classic, but again, I think I said this in my last email, if it's not your jam, make this Thanksgiving your own and just make the dishes that you really love. Don't feel compelled to make all of the things that are always on the menu. I even surveyed my daughters and my boyfriend and we're scaling back on all the dishes we're making. So I'm gonna talk about how to make a turkey roulade, which was a, a fancy way of saying that really pretty turkey roll up that I emailed last week and that I posted. And I'm gonna show you in general how to make it from a turkey breast. I'm gonna talk about how to cook one of those versus turkey tenderloin, which was another uh, sheet pan idea that I had I'd, uh, shared with you guys last week. Then we're gonna move into, once we've covered different ways of preparing a smaller amount of turkey this year, we're gonna talk about things like roasting your veggies all on one pan and how to save oven space and minimize cleanup because I'd personally rather be relaxing after Thanksgiving dinner than sitting around doing dishes all night. I'm gonna talk about different herbs that you can use to season your turkey and your other dishes. Then we're gonna get into, the, I had some, uh, some questions from some of you guys. And, and by the way, feel free to jump on the chat right now in the Zoom. If you could, I set this up to have your mics off. If somebody does wanna jump on and talk to me at the end, I'm, more than welcome to do that, but I'm sure we're all over all those Zoom calls where everyone's talking over each other and it's too hard to hear what's going on. But feel free to put questions in the chat. And I put my, my boyfriend, Brian, over, is over there watching, monitoring, so he can let me know if anybody has a major question and then we'll do them at the end. Uh, I did get some special requests for dishes to lighten up. One was a carrot and turnip mashed casserole. Another one was one of my favorites. It's a cornbread and sausage stuffing. So I have ideas for that. I'm gonna talk about ways to lighten up your mashed potatoes. Those are obviously a classic, as well as for a lot of people love that green bean casserole with the little crumbled onions on top and the cream of mushroom soup. I have a, a lighter, brighter, healthier way to make that. We're going to talk about different garnishes for your roasted veggies and other vegetables that are easy ways to add a lot of flavor without spending a lot of time or money or adding too many calories or smart points. I'm also going to cover, we got a lot, right? But we're gonna have fun, don't worry. We're gonna go through all these things and you're gonna come away with lots of easy ideas you can use for Thanksgiving next week or for weeknight dinners too. Then I'm gonna show you ways to gussy up store-bought gravy because I'm sorry, if you're not roasting a whole bird, you're not gonna have enough drippings to make a gravy. And I have really easy ways to take something that you buy and make it taste way more homemade and delicious. And I'm gonna show you how to make my fresh cranberry chutney, which is an easy way to make a cranberry sauce that's not super jello-y. Hey, if, if you like the one in the can, go for it. But for a lot of people, if they wanna lighten it up and cut the sugars, I'm gonna show you a way to use fresh cranberries in an easy way to brighten up your cranberry sauce and a hack to lighten up even the canned cranberry sauce. Does that sound good? Tell me if I missed anything in the chat. And also, 
do me a favor and say in the chat if you know me or how we met. That way people can all check out the chat and see, because I'm sure there are some people on there who I've met on the Weight Watchers cruises or in my personal life or in workshops for Weight Watchers and things like that. Okay, turkey roulade. So my first tip to you when it comes to getting special cuts or special things done with meats is to as quickly as you can, and this is actually goes just in general in life, make friends with the butcher at your supermarket or at a local smaller gourmet store. They usually are kind of bored in the back, just monitoring the packaging of meats. And I've found, I have a few favorites in Hoboken where I live who will do like special cuts and special things for me. So what we're gonna do to make this roulade, I'm gonna hold things up. What you need to do is start with a boned out whole turkey breast, which means both sides, <laughs> sorry, a little graphic there, Julie, both sides of the breast. So it's going to look like this. Now this is an excellent option for you, by the way, if you wanna just do quick turkey breast for, I don't know, I would say this would serve about like four to six people with some leftovers. Um, but what you can ask your butcher to do, and I'll show you loosely how to do it here too, is butterfly it for you and pound it out. And I'll show you what the result is going to look like on this pan. And then I'll give you the basic cuts if you did wanna do it at home. It's not hard, it's just, I don't know about you, I know not everyone loves getting their hands on raw poultry and really getting in there. But if you're Italian like me and you grew up pounding out chicken cutlets with your grandma, you're not gonna have a problem. It's basically the same thing. So what you're gonna wind up with is turkey that looks like this. So this whole turkey breast was flipped over and cut into on either side and unrolled basically. So it comes out flat like this. And then you lay plastic wrap over the top and you pound the top with your meat tenderizer, just like you would do a chicken cutlet. And what you're looking for here is to get like a nice flat spread of turkey so you can fill it with whatever stuffings or flavorings you want. So the picture that I shared had stuffing put in the middle, which I think is actually, I might do that next week for Thanksgiving. I'm still kind of finalizing my own menu to be honest. But I think that putting stuffing in the turkey roll up is gonna give a lot of great flavor. It gives you that dose of stuffing without feeling like you need to make a whole tray of stuffing that you might not get to use up if you're only cooking for a small group or that you might go overboard on if you don't wanna be eating too much stuffing. So since it's just gonna be going in the middle, you don't have to go crazy making an entire big batch. You can just buy like some cube stuffing mix. A great way though to add extra flavor to this and really season it up. And this is a great way to lighten it up too is just to add some sauteed vegetables when you make your stuffing. You could add sauteed mushrooms. I have these here, I'm gonna be talking about these later. I love using cremini mushrooms. They're baby button, uh, excuse me, baby bella mushrooms. You know how those big portobello mushrooms are used as veggie burgers pretty often in restaurants? These are a baby version of them, so they taste very meaty and savory. So when you chop these up and saute them just in some cooking spray or a little bit of oil and add it to your stuffing, it's gonna give it more richness and more meatiness without adding any or very little calories and fat if you use just a little bit of oil. So that's one of my tips. And by the way, with the cornbread stuffing question that somebody asked, oh gosh, I love cornbread stuffing, it's so good. The best way to lighten that up would be same idea, just add some sauteed vegetables to it. Use a lighter cornbread. You might need to go seek out like fat-free corn muffins or low-fat corn muffins so that they're not as heavy as the regular. I would then saute, you could either do uh, mushrooms, onions, and peppers would be really yummy. Or if you like that sweet and savory kind of a vibe, you could even do like onion, celery, apple. And what you're doing is adding more body to your stuffing so it's not just all bread. Um, and then you would definitely add fresh herbs. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these. Thanksgiving is definitely a time to splurge and treat yourself to some fresh herbs. And I'm gonna give you lots of ways to use them and um, how to add lots of flavor to them and ways to use them up too. Okay, so if we're gonna stuff our roulade with some stuffing, this would take about three cups and now I'm gonna to have to get in there. So I'm gonna to have to take a break and wash my hands in a second too, but I'll just show you the idea. You could, use about three cups of stuffing across the top of this. Or if you wanted, if you weren't into the stuffing vibe, a really fun way to do this is to make, have you guys had porchetta? It's like an Italian dish, it's so delicious. It has either prosciutto or bacon over pork and then sage, fresh sage and fennel seed and garlic inside, it's delicious. You could also put just chopped fresh herbs and garlic and maybe some lemon zest in the middle here before you roll it up and that would infuse your turkey with great flavor. So once you've put your filling in, you're just gonna get, you gotta get in there guys and get a little aggressive. You just get in there and you roll it up just like a jelly roll. 
I had my butcher leave the skin on because it's turkey breast, it's going to dry out a little bit quicker in the oven. If you want, you could ask them to take it off for you and then either lay it over the top to kind of help baste your turkey roulade, or you could also just take turkey bacon is a really fun one that's light and easy and kind of fun. And you can wrap that around it just like this. You don't need to, but if you wanna have it look really, really perfect, like in that picture where it was nice and tight, you're gonna to wanna to have some kitchen twine. I hate telling you guys to buy things that you're only gonna use once every, I don't know how many years you're gonna be doing something like this. But if you do have kitchen twine, you would just cut it into little sections and tie it in knots around it. And that's gonna just help hold the whole thing together. But I promise I've tested this recipe a lot of different ways for Weight Watchers with all different stuffings and fillings. And I never had one explode when I didn't use the kitchen twine. So that's your basics on how to put together a roulade. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about timing for turkey and poultry. And it was something that I brought up in my email last week too. Let me just move this guy out of the way. I have so much stuff out here, you guys. Let me show you really quickly too while my hands are all turkeyed up. I don't know if that's a verb. I'm just making it up as I go. <laughs> it should be a verb. So here, hope this isn't grossing anyone out. I think if you're a vegetarian, you wouldn't really be on here. This is what it would normally look like if you just bought a whole turkey breast and defrosted it. So what you would do on your own to turn it into a roulade is basically cut into each breast this way, just down the middle, not all the way through, just to kind of make a notch, like a groove. And then you're gonna work your knife across, almost like you're creating a little book. This is also a technique you can do with pork tenderloin, by the way. So like get it to lay flat. You go in halfway and then across a little bit and then it unrolls. I don't know if you guys can see what I just did there, like that. So you do that to both sides. Then you would just lay plastic wrap over the top and pound it out to an even thickness and then roll it away from you. So that's your basics for a roulade. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the tenderloin too. And then I'm just gonna put this on the side in one second and wash my sticky hands and I'll be right back. But I'm gonna let you know how to exactly, how to get your poultry so it's timed perfectly and comes out really juicy. Okay, by the way, because I'm still mic'd up, I will say this. In culinary school, they made, hello, I'm back. They made the biggest deal and it was reassuring and scary for me, I guess, about uh, cross-contamination with poultry. Um, you really, really, truly do have to be very careful when you're touching raw chicken breast, raw turkey breast, any raw poultry to make sure you wash your hands. And if you've been touching other things to sterilize the surface, I tend to be a very relaxed person, but that's one that they really drilled into us. So I just wanna make sure you guys know that too. So the thing with any lean cut of meat, like a chicken breast or a turkey breast, the turkey roulade, the other idea that I had here, and this is actually part of the turkey breast or the turkey tenderloins. You can see like I have here in the middle of the sheet pan, I'll talk about those in a minute. Lean cuts of meat have less fat. That's why they're lean, but that means they dry out really quickly too. And that's why when you're cooking chicken breasts at home and making yourself dinner, or you're cooking them on the grill and you're like, why are these coming out so dry? Or again, if you're like me or you're being careful and you wanna make sure that they're cooked to the right temperature, you're constantly checking them and cutting into them. This is one of my must have kitchen gadgets. And I'm really not like a specialized gadget girl, but these just come in so handy and it's gonna ensure that your turkey and your chicken comes out great. It's a digital thermometer. So in culinary school, they gave us the ones that chefs carry around, like where it spins around to the number, but then you have to keep recalibrating it. And I'm sorry, I don't know who has time for that. These are not that expensive. What you're gonna do, you insert the probe in your poultry and then this model, and a lot of them have this, the wire actually comes out of your oven. So this sits on the counter. So while you're hanging out prep, prepping some other things, you can keep your eye on the cooking temperature of the inside of your chicken or turkey to know exactly when it's done. Now, the safe cooking temperature to bring it to is 165 degrees, but I don't know if you know this, meats keep cooking when you take them out of the oven or off the grill. So that often what they'll tell you to do and what a good idea is to make sure it's really juicy is to pull it out when it's at about 
160 and then just put a little piece of foil over it and let it rest. And you, and you do know to rest before you slice your meat, right? It kind of regroups itself from cooking and keeps all the juices in and lets it come to its full cooking temperature. So I highly recommend, you can get one of these. If you went online tonight, you could grab one of these on Amazon really cheap and get, get it by next week for yourself. And you'll use it all the time for all different meats and chicken. I can't recommend them enough. I actually have one that has an alarm that goes off, which is super cool too. Not now, but sometimes you're like getting ready for guests to come over and have a party and you don't want to have to keep running into the kitchen to check. So, okay, digital meat thermometer. We covered our turkey. I'm going to give you some general timings for these, but again, everyone's oven is different. The thickness of your meat's going to make a difference. Um, how long you preheated your oven, how many other things are in there. So personally, I'd always rather know I'm using my, my thermometer to get it right. I jotted these down though, just so you have, have a sense when you're planning your meal for next week. So a tenderloin like this one would be great just to serve two people, you can see. And that one's gonna cook in about like 30 to 35 minutes at 400 degrees. And I love doing it just like this along with some veggies and you've got an easy, awesome, like mini Thanksgiving dinner for yourself in like 40 minutes, which is great. So the butterfly roulade that we opened up and pounded out and stuffed and rolled up, that one is gonna take longer because it's thicker, you can, you can kind of get a sense of that, right? It's about 40 to 45 minutes at 400 degrees. So if you were gonna go for a pretty roulade for next week, and I would love it if you did. And if you do, I want you to send me pictures. I wanna like high five you and cheer for you and see how beautiful your food came out. You could totally put that right in this sheet pan too with these veggies, just like I'm doing with this turkey tenderloin here. And how awesome is that? I mean, the thing that usually happens with Thanksgiving dinner is that that big old bird takes up the entire oven and you can't make anything else. This is easy cleanup. It's only taking up one rack in your oven so you can do other dishes too. So the roulade is about that long. A whole turkey breast, you know, the one that I showed you before it was pounded out and all of that, it's even thicker. So that one I would give closer to 50 minutes to cook. It might even go up to an hour, depending again on how your oven is calibrated and such. Seriously, it really doesn't matter what temperature you're cooking it at, whether it's 350 or 400, you really just need to measure the inside of the center to make sure it's cooked through. So, okay, that's my little turkey primer. Maybe I should pause here. Does anybody have any I'm gonna have Brian help me out here. Does anybody have any questions about like turkey ideas, turkey tips? You can take the skin off if you want, if you wanna keep it really lean. Like I said, keeping it on, will give you that nice crispiness. With the roulade, you could have it taken off and lay it over the top. Um, oh, for the, really quick, for the, in case people are putting questions in, for the turkey tenderloins, these are actually sold in supermarkets pre-marinated. So you might wanna go check it out tomorrow before the rush next week, if you are interested in doing one of these. I mean, that like slashes so much of your prep time. If you wanted to add extra flavor to a plain tenderloin like this, your basic combination of some lemon zest, some garlic and some chopped herbs, and I'll show you these herbs and we'll talk about them. You could just rub that on top. You could rub that on top of the roulade or on top of the breast, the single breast under the skin, and it's gonna give really great flavor without a lot of work. So, hey, did anybody have any questions about the turkey, Brian? No, everyone's good. Oh, uh, with the bone. Everything takes longer bone in. Um, so again, this is a guess. Don't like time it to that and then take it out. Seriously, please invest in one of these. I think you can get these for like 15 bucks. Even if it's not the one that comes out of the oven, you can get one where you just like check it every 10 minutes or so. Um, I believe with a bone in, it's gonna take closer to an hour to cook. But the nice thing about doing it bone in and leaving the skin on, if you did want to go ahead and make yourself a quick gravy, you could cook that on a, like a roasting rack over a pan to catch some of the drippings. And that's a tip. And what I'll move into next, maybe just because we're talking about it, is how to do some quick gravy hacks for small amounts of cooking. So if you wanted to, like I was saying, I'm just going to move this over here because I'm not done talking about the veggies yet. We have all kinds of fun ideas for, uh, for veggie sides. Okay. I know I'm a chef. I went to culinary school, but you know what? If you're doing something like this, you're not gonna have enough drippings to make gravy. It's going to be an exercise in frustration. You're gonna be sitting there with like butter and flour making the roux. You could make a homemade gravy that way. If you've ever done gravy, um, you start with some butter and a little bit of flour as a thickener. You would then add your pan drippings if you had any. 
And what you could do to make a quick gravy for yourself, if you didn't want to buy these, because these can be high in sodium, and I know some people are watching their sodium, you could instead add some low sodium chicken broth. So a little bit of butter, equal part butter flour, just a little bit, whisk it in a small pan until it lightly browns, add any drippings you have, add some broth, let it thicken, and you could cook it down a little bit too. Just like crank the heat up so it cooks down to get a little bit thicker. But the best way to add great flavor to your gravy or a store-bought gravy like what I have here is to add either some sauteed chopped mushrooms to it. Again, it's gonna give that meatiness, that it'd be like a yummy mushroom gravy for people that like mushrooms. Other ideas are to add some classic herbs. By the way, you guys, I was laughing. I laid these out and I did the Simon and Garfunkel song without, <laughs> without meaning to. Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. So for those of you, again, who are cooking just for, where did I put that guy? He's out here somewhere. For those of you who are cooking just for yourself, I'll find it. Oh, here. They have it in a little teeny container, the rosemary, sage, and thyme, which are just classic poultry herbs. And you can see you're going to get just a little amount. It would be just enough to use to season some turkey tenderloin for two or to use for garnishes for other things too. So what you could do is just mince up some fresh herbs. Any one of these would be great. So parsley, um, if you don't cook with herbs a lot, has like a grassy, bright, just like a very classic herbal, <laughs> silly word to use, but uh, easy herbal note that goes with really anything you're cooking. Sage has a little bit more, I don't know how to describe it. It's a little bit more like a scent that you would associate with like a pork chop is a good way to put it. It's a little more savory. It's not exactly like pine, but it's edging towards that. So you've got to go a little bit lighter with sage. If you add too much, it might be a little overpowering for you. Rosemary is one of my favorites and so delicious, but this one too, for some people, if you go overboard, it can taste a little bit like a pine tree. So start small, add a little bit, give it a taste, and then add more if you like. Thyme, you can go as heavy as you like. Um, thyme is delicious. I add it to honey to drizzle on cheese. You can put thyme on honestly just about any super stew. It tastes amazing. What you do wanna do though, when you're using fresh thyme, is it's on kind of a woody stem. So you don't, you don't wanna just chop the stem up. You just kind of run your finger across it like this. And you guys can see, you pull out the little thyme leaves. I'm just gonna sprinkle it on my sweet potatoes here. And then another herb that's a great one to buy that works with anything, like I said, with parsley is fresh chives. And they come in little tiny containers too. So you're not spending a ton of money on something that you're not gonna to get to use up. So other hacks to make your gravy taste a little bit more homemade if you're buying it in a jar like this or you're making, I actually picked this up only because if you're just making a quick Thanksgiving dinner just for yourself, you could always just scoop a little bit of this guy out and make it in the microwave and you'll have just enough gravy just for you. And then you could keep it for another day. For this guy, if you were making gravy just for you, you could freeze it into an ice cube tray any leftovers. And then once it's frozen in little cubes, you could pop them out and put them in a freezer baggie or a container and then just defrost them when you need them to add to like a chicken breast or turkey or meatloaf or whatever you're making later on. So another addition that's like a sneaky little tip of mine to brighten up either of these gravies is to add a teeny tiny bit of apple cider vinegar. If you have apple cider vinegar, you could also do white wine vinegar. You could do white balsamic. Adding that little tiny dash of brightness that vinegar has at the end is going to make this not taste like you bought it at the supermarket on a shelf. So those are my little gravy hacks. Let me know. Hey, Brian, do you mind checking? Does anybody have any questions about ideas for gravy? I don't know if that's a must have for you for Thanksgiving or it's kind of a kind of a whatever. I'm sort of a neutral gravy girl. I mean, I guess I like it. It's good on, ticket, on turkey breast because it does give it a little bit more oomph and Oh, your turkey's gonna be so juicy because you're gonna be using your, uh, your meat thermometer, right? So now I'm gonna start getting into some veggie sides. I, but feel free to chime in in the chat if this is helpful, if you want more detail, if there's something I'm leaving out or so far we've covered turkey and we've covered gravy. So next I'm gonna talk about our different veggie sides. Now I've always joked around that to me, a Thanksgiving dinner has to have at least one green vegetable and one orange vegetable, which sounds silly, but that was why when I put this together, I went with 
Brussels sprouts and sweet potatoes. And I just want to share a tip with you here about making honestly just about any vegetable taste more delicious. I love to roast my vegetables. It's, it's the easiest way to make them. It condenses the natural sugars in the vegetables. It gives that delicious browning and crispiness that you love in like fried foods and things like that, but it keeps it really healthy. And my top tip to get the best roasted vegetable results are to use, let me see, let me tip it for you guys over here, to line your pan with parchment paper. Now, I don't know if you have a box of this like hanging out under your cabinet, like with the foil from when you tried to make that brownie recipe and it's just sitting back there. I use this just about every single time I make like sweet potato fries, roasted Brussels sprouts, roasted cauliflower. You can roast white potatoes. The reason I love using parchment, it absorbs any moisture that the vegetable's giving off while it cooks. So it actually helps it brown a little bit more and it makes a perfect nonstick surface. You know how when you roast a vegetable sometimes and you go, oh, you have to go at high heat too, like 400 degrees would be great for this with the turkey. If you were just doing a pan of vegetables, you could go at like 450 degrees and the paper won't go on fire. It'll get a little brown, but the reason I love it, instead of if you did foil and your sweet potato cube was roasting and it had that beautiful brown crispy finish to it, you'd then be there with your spatula trying to scrape it off. And usually the foil tears, if you're doing it on a plain cookie sheet, you'd have to use tons of oil on the pan to keep it from sticking. And even still, you wind up scraping and you lose some of that yummy, crispy, golden brown flavor that you were looking for. So the other bonus for parchment, I am very anti-dishes. I'm guessing you are pretty done with dishes at this point too, from quarantine and whatnot. When you use parchment, you just take it off and give your sheet pan a quick rinse and it's pretty much clean and good to go. It's so much easier to clean up. So that's my little thing on roasting vegetables. So once you roasted these two, I wanted to give you some ideas for ways to top them, to give them a lot of flavor. Now you could start out roasting them with just a little bit of cooking spray if you're trying to keep things really light, just to give them a little coating of oil before they go in the oven. You could also put them in a bowl and toss them with some olive oil or some oil if you're, you're not worrying about smart points or calories or whatnot. But honestly, I use cooking spray a lot because here's one of my sneaky little um, lighten anything up tricks. The less oil you use when you're cooking the base of your food, to me, it's almost like playing like a math game. You're saying, okay, if I cut here, I can add more there. So the idea being, I have some little garnish ideas here. Let's say we roasted our little sweet potato cubes here and just cooking spray with some salt and pepper. Now we've left ourselves room to add like fun toppings that maybe do have a little more fat or sugar or calories. You could do toasted pecans. You could do, my daughter asked for these and it is really fun. Instead of that really, really sticky sweet sweet potato casserole, you could add some mini marshmallows to the top of these sweet potatoes right at the end of cooking just to get bubbly and brown on top to give you that fix that you want. Um, another fun one is some dried cranberries. Do be careful with dried fruit though. They're really high in calories and sugar. It's, it's such a bummer. You would think they'd be healthy, but if you ever check that out, you'll notice. So go sparingly. Um, if you want to keep these really light, well, you could also do like, this would be so fun. Oh, I do have it. A little bit of cinnamon would be nice. Um, they get sweet enough on their own. You really don't even need brown sugar, but you could do a little sprinkling of that or a drizzle of maple if you wanted to, that would be fun on your Brussels sprouts. If you're a Brussels sprout fan, like I am, one of my favorite things to drizzle on top after roasting them is just a little bit of balsamic vinegar or balsamic glaze. If you want that like sweet and tangy kind of a vibe, you could do a tiny bit of maple syrup and a tiny bit of balsamic. So again, by not dousing them in oil, covering your cookie sheet in oil before you roast them, it gives you more wiggle room at the end to add all kinds of flavor. You could do shaved Parmesan because you saved at the beginning. So. Let me know what you guys think of that in the chat. And I'm gonna move on to some other veggie sides that are really fun. So to answer the question, actually, let me just move, let me move this big basket of vegetables here and start sharing some ideas with you. Okay, so another really quickly before I move on to these guys, I found this at the supermarket and it cracked me up. It's a sweet potato. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, it's been scrubbed 
and it's wrapped in microwave safe plastic. And I know some people are anti-plastic and anti-microwave and that's totally cool. You could also do a whole sweet potato, just prick it with a fork, wrap it in foil and throw it on your cookie sheet with your turkey while it's roasting to roast. And then you could split it open and do your different toppings and garnishes on it. But if you were in a hurry for a sweet potato fix, I thought this was pretty cool. Microwaves in six minutes. If you want like sweet potato for one, I just grabbed that to show it to you. Okay, let's talk about different um, mashed veggie options. So someone had a question and it's actually not a Thanksgiving tradition of mine. I'd love to hear in the chat if it is for anybody else. Mashed carrots and turnips. Um, so I looked up the recipe and I checked it out. And of course, probably the reason why it's such a classic or a favorite and so delicious, it's usually made with carrots and turnips that are cooked and pureed, but with like heavy cream and tons of butter and brown sugar on top because turnips can tend to be a little bit sharp and a little bit bitter almost to the palate. So some ideas I had for my friend who asked that and how to lighten them up, you would do the same thing and start with a pot, um, peel your carrots obviously and wash your turnips. These turnips we found at the farmer's market, they were, they were labeled sweet turnips. So if you can find these at your farmer's market or in your supermarket, that's gonna kind of save you from having to add a ton of sugar at the end. Another idea to add really great flavor to this, instead of simmering these in water, why not? I'm a big fan of cooking things in chicken broth because it's gonna give it like extra flavor and extra body and like a whole boost without adding a ton of calories and fat. So I would just lightly cover them in your saucepan with a little bit of chicken broth and simmer them. And then when it's time to mash or puree them, I have to show you guys this. I was mentioning how I don't love having too many kitchen gadgets and I'm not big on saying you have to buy every gadget under the sun, but this one I use so often, I just wanna show it to you. Again, not expensive, doesn't take up a lot of room. You guys have one of these or have you seen these? They go by either a stick blender or an immersion blender. And the reason I love these so much, the end just pops off like this, it can go in the dishwasher. It's so easy to clean. And what makes it, <laughs> my dog Harvey's wandering around. He must smell something. Okay. Let's say you finished cooking your carrot turnip mixture in here. You can drain off if there's a little bit of extra chicken broth, but I would leave a little bit in there just to kind of help pull it together. All you need to do instead of getting out your potato masher or putting this in your other blender is put this in the pot and turn it on and it's gonna spin and puree everything in your pot. So these are great also to make butternut squash soup or pureed black bean soup, or if you're making a tomato sauce and you wanna smooth it out, or if you're, um, if you're making a chili and you wanna partially puree the beans before you add other ingredients in to give it thickness. I really, really love these. So consider getting one of these if you're a big fan of making soups and stews and things like that. Oh, there he is. I'll have to have him come say hi to you guys somehow. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, immersion blender. So I hope that answered the question and an idea. So again, what I would do once it's pureed to add that creaminess to it, instead of adding heavy cream, I've got two of my favorite little hacks here. You could add a little bit of low fat milk, but sometimes that tastes a little bit thin. I love to use low fat yogurt or plain Greek yogurt. Um, if you find Greek yogurt too tart, you can seek out a type called Skyr. It's S-K-Y-R. It's Icelandic style yogurt. Um, that's their name for it, S-K-Y-R, Skyr. It just isn't as tart and biting as Greek yogurt is, but it's a great thing to puree into vegetables to give it that creamy feeling and a little bit of tart edge that tastes good without adding a ton of smart points or fat or calories. Another idea, but just go light on this one. But again, it'll, it'll do the same trick without having to add a ton of heavy cream. You could add a little tiny bit of light cream cheese to your pureed vegetables. And it's gonna kind of pull it together and give it that yummy mouthfeel and give it a little bit of creaminess. And then I would top it with a little bit of brown sugar and a little bit of cinnamon. And that should do the trick at balancing the carrot turnip creamy vibe, but lightening that dish up. Okay, like moving on to another favorite Thanksgiving puree. Mashed potatoes are probably on most people's list of gotta haves for Thanksgiving. And I have a really fun way to lighten those up while still making them taste amazing. And also it lets you make them ahead of time because one thing that's always been a pain for me about, and maybe for you too, when you make mashed potatoes for an event, you're sitting there waiting over the stove, mashing the potatoes while everybody's sitting down because you have to make them fresh and serve them hot. They're really a pain in the neck to reheat. 
here's my hack for mashed potatoes. So you can use either russet potatoes or classic or Yukon Gold have like the waxier skin. Um, those actually come out a lot creamier. So if you like your mashed potatoes really creamy, I recommend you use Yukon Gold potatoes or wax potatoes versus the russets. But you're gonna peel them and cook them in the pot. You could do those in chicken broth too if you wanted to. But here's the hack. What you can do is use half of another vegetable in with, or even if half seems like too much, you could do like two thirds peeled cubed potato and two thirds something like cauliflower. I feel like cauliflower is everywhere these days. It's like the hero of the vegetable world or something. But I do think that when you cook it in with mashed potatoes and puree it and add your seasonings, it's the kind of like chameleon vegetable that can sort of hide in there. It's going to give it a nice creaminess and cut the amount of like calories and carbs and things like that in half from what you did with your potatoes. The other bonus, by the way, of adding another vegetable in when you cook your potato. So potatoes have this thing when you mash them, you know how sometimes they get gluey and they're like gummy and they pull and they're just, you don't even really want to eat them anymore. There's a, like a starch in potatoes that causes them to do that. When you add another vegetable to the potato, when you cook it and when you puree it or mash it, it's going to minimize how much that, the possibility of that happening. I've actually never had it happen. And you can even just use your, again, your immersion blender or your stick blender to puree your potatoes with cauliflower mixture. You could make that ahead of time, like a day ahead of time even, or if you had leftovers, they reheat great. They don't like dry up and seize up and get gummy and weird. So another favorite one of mine, and this one's a little bit more obscure, uh, but I really love this vegetable. I'm just curious, I'm gonna hold it up. Let's see if anybody in the chat, can anybody tell me in the chat what this vegetable is? Brian's, Brian's looking right now to see. I'm gonna hold up two of them. Anybody have any ideas? You guys see it? Oh, someone, all right, go shout out. Who is it? Angela? Hey, Angela, it's celery root. Ding, 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 you win. I wish I could give you something. <laughs> it's a celery root or a celery act, it, you might see it called. Now, it's kind of crazy to imagine you guys, but if we were gonna pretend we were farmers or whatnot, even celery has a root. Okay, when it grows. So this guy is what's underneath the earth when your regular green celery comes up. But the thing that's cool about it, it's, it's the root of the celery, it's denser. And when you cook it and puree it, it has like the slightest celery flavor to it, but it comes out really creamy and luscious and delicious. So similar to like a, a, a lovely pureed mashed potato. So my other favorite mashed potato lightening up hack is to do half potato and half celery root. Now, a lot of bigger supermarkets will have this. You just have to look by those like furry root vegetables. You know, they always have that one section with all the veggies with like the hair on them. You'll probably find it there or you can ask your grocer too. They might know where it is or have it. Another idea, another favorite veggie. And by the way, this one I should have mentioned for my carrot and turnip puree question. You guys like cooking with parsnips? You know what these babies are? These are another favorite of mine. They're like they're similar to carrots, but they have a little bit more body to them and starch to them. And they're not as strong flavor. They have like a really beautiful light sweetness to them. You could also peel and cube some parsnips and add those in with your potatoes or in your carrot turnip puree. And it's just gonna help balance out the flavors, give it sweetness, cut carbs and cut calories. So when you're finished pureeing it, again, just like with your turnips, you can totally add a little bit of Greek yogurt to your mashed potatoes or your potato cauliflower puree, your potato celery root puree, or a little tiny bit of light cream cheese. A little bit goes a long way. It'll just help give you that, like it fakes out that flavor as if you dumped in tons of butter and tons of heavy cream. Also, let me just say this. I know I'm giving lots of tips for how to lighten this up and lighten that up. 2020 has been one hell of a year. <laughs> Sorry for cursing if that offended anybody, but here's the thing. If you have a favorite dish that is your like iconic Thanksgiving memory from childhood that you really, really want, 
oh my gosh, go ahead and make it. Make the full fat version, enjoy the heck out of it and just lighten up the dishes that you're kind of met or neutral or okay, I'm not like super attached to that dish. I just wanna like make sure someone in your life told you to do that. So even if you're, you know, uh, doing great on the WW plan, like Thanksgiving is a holiday where you, you actually should allow yourself that one indulgent favorite childhood memory and get back on track the next day and all of that. That was my little public service, <laughs> public service announcement for everybody. All right, this basket of veggies is gonna move away for a second. I'm gonna talk about another veggie side that is a favorite for a lot of people. That weighs a lot. Okay, green bean casserole. Do you guys like green bean casserole? Who's into that? I'm not gonna lie, it's not my jam. Even when I was a little kid, I do like the jerky crunchy onions to put on top though. Can you guys let me know in the chat if you guys like green bean casserole? Oh, okay, thank you. I'm sorry about that. Brian's slacking over there. I've got to give him, he's actually being a great boyfriend. He helped me set up the lights and the camera to do this for you guys. And by the way, I also would love to get feedback from you and be honest, be brutally honest. Helpful, not helpful. You'd love this, you'd love that. Like I would really like to do more events just for you like this. I really appreciate you being here and being part of my Happy Beats Healthy community. And I want to tailor these live events just, to, just for you to make sure that they're helpful. So reheating your mashed potatoes. If you use half veggie, like I'm recommending, like half cauliflower. Oh, oh, by the way, another hack, buy the frozen cauliflower florets. You don't, you don't need to be, for the mashed potatoes, you don't need to be chopping up a head of cauliflower for that if you don't want to. It'll puree and even easier actually. All you need to do is warm them either in, a good rule of thumb for reheating things is to reheat them the way you cook them. So if you had leftover roasted veggies and you wanted to get them browned again, reheat them on a pan in your toaster oven. I love using my toaster oven as a mini oven, by the way. So if you don't have a good one, upgrade and get a good one with like a bigger pan that you can actually do some like roasting and cooking in. For mashed potatoes, if it's a small amount, you could reheat them in your uh, a small saucepan. Another idea for you guys, if you're regularly cooking for just one or two people, and you only have large size pots and pans, go ahead and invest in like small saucepans, small saute pans, because they're just gonna let you heat up smaller or cook smaller amounts of food without it drying out. I have a confession to make. I rely on my microwave an awful lot for reheating foods. Um, and a way that I would do mashed potatoes, especially with the veggie puree, I would just add a tiny bit of water and cover it. I don't even use plastic wrap. I actually usually just use an upside down plate on top of the bowl and warm it up for like a minute or two, give it a stir, maybe one more minute and it should come back fine. Microwaves, in case you didn't know this, they actually dry food out when they cook it. So by covering things either with plastic or with just like an upside down plate, you're gonna keep some of that moisture in so it won't dry out as much. And it also helps with all those spatters that get all over your microwave door and the inside. And like I said, I'm anti cleanup. I want your life to be as easy as possible. So does anybody have any other questions so far? I'm gonna move on to cover, we're gonna do the green bean casserole and then the cranberry sauce. I have a fun garnish if you make a cocktail for Thanksgiving or even if you just wanna like gussy up some seltzer to make it feel a little bit more special for yourself. And then we can talk a little bit about dessert. So does anybody have any questions in the chat? No, everybody's good. Okay, cool. Green bean casserole. Okay, kind of a funny uh, segue there because we're back to microwaves again, but these are so handy, you guys. Do you ever buy the green beans in the bag that you can actually just microwave? Now, again, if you don't feel comfortable with plastic in the microwave, they do make these special to be safe for the microwave. What you would do is just prick it with a fork, pop it in the microwave on a plate and your green beans come out perfectly. If you didn't want to do it that way, you could just do them in some well-salted boiling water. What I would recommend, people tend to overcook their green beans. And I think that's why we hated them so much as a kid. They get like mushy and mealy and they just don't have great flavor. So I would recommend cooking them just until they're like a nice bright green on a stovetop. They really only take like five to seven minutes. If you're going for that nostalgic green bean casserole vibe, I think they were a lot softer, so you might want to cook them a little bit longer. But here's the hack to make that recipe a lot lighter. I believe it's usually got a can of cream of mushroom soup dumped on top of it, maybe. So what we're going to do instead, remember those mushrooms that we got? 
This is a family size pack. You can get a small pack. You can even buy these guys individually. And they were cremini, C-R-E-M-I-N-I, -I, or um, baby Bella mushrooms. They just have the best uh, meaty flavor. What you're gonna do to give your green beans an oomph is saute some of these in a tiny bit of butter or a little bit of cooking spray if you were trying to keep things light. Stir that in with your green beans with, you're never gonna believe it, one of these heroes again, a little bit, tiny bit of light cream cheese or a little tiny bit. You can actually use as much of the yogurt as you want. You could even use a little bit of both, but what's going to happen, it's going to bring it all together and give it that yummy creaminess that you were looking for um, from that cream of mushroom soup with way less sodium and fat and calories. And it's just like a healthier way to make a knockoff of that recipe. And then go ahead and hit the top with your crispy jerky onions. If that's what you like, you could even buy, if you want, didn't want to get the whole can of those, you guys know those little um, funnions, those little onion uh, chips? You could buy a tiny bag of those if you're cooking for a small amount of people and just crush them up and sprinkle those on top. And that'll give you that like green bean, creamy, mushroom, savory, crunchy onion vibe. And you could make it in a small casserole dish. So I thought that was like a fun little idea. I might actually try that one. Okay, cranberry sauce. So I do love cranberry sauce. I love that tart, uh, lightly sweet vibe to go with all of the savory, different savory dishes that I've been making. But if you're only cooking for one or two people, you might not wanna bother buying like a whole can. And a lot of people, Brian actually was just mentioning to me that he doesn't even like the kind that's like pureed in the can. I feel like, what do you guys think? I'd love to have a vote. Are you guys on like team, team cranberry sauce, like chunky or the, the one that your mom or your grandma would slice and like, splay out onto the plate. Let me know in the chat what you guys think of cranberry sauce. Guys still there? Chunky. Chunky. Yeah, I'm so with you. Both. I, I, you know what's funny? I'm, I definitely, I'm like a kid. I, when I was a little kid, I think I loved the, uh, the smooth one. I would just like eat the whole slice of it. Don't even, I don't even. <laughs> I had definitely had funny food tastes when I was a kid and that's possibly why I decided to go to culinary school. Okay, so what we're gonna do this year is upgrade our cranberry sauce. Here's a hack if you do wanna buy the can, if you don't wanna deal with buying fresh cranberries and making your own cranberry sauce. Buy the can of Chunky or the jar, I've seen little mini jarred ones too, to cut the sugar and cut the calories and make it a little bit lighter and actually to even add some brightness and fresh flavor to it, you can just add some diced, peeled, or not peeled if you don't mind the peel, apple or some chopped up orange. I love that orange cranberry kind of fall vibe. I think it goes great with sweet potatoes and turkey and flavors like that. And apple and cranberry are such a classic. So that's just a really fast hack to buy something that's packed with sugar. And if you check out that jar, you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, like I didn't, you know, I wanna eat all the different foods on Thanksgiving and save some for dessert and not splurge it all on cranberry sauce. So by just adding some chopped fresh fruit to it, you're gonna cut your calories and sugar by a lot. So here's another kitchen gadget. This guy's a little bit odd. It doesn't have to look like this, but do you guys have a mini chop or like a mini food processor? They're really, really great. And I know a lot of you are cooking for one or two all the time. They make it so much easier to just like chop up an onion before you saute it, to chop up some carrot, to chop, you know, chop up anything. I, I'm a big fan of any kitchen gadget that's gonna make it easier for you to cook healthier without taking too much time and stressing yourself out. So. To make this cranberry chutney, and I'll show you what it's going to come out looking like, and I'll give you like a, the briefest demo, and I'll tell you the proportions too. You're just going to take fresh, oops, <laughs> it's dropped one. You're going to take fresh cranberries. Um, here's a, an idea for you, because I did notice that the bags of fresh cranberries are ginormous, and if you're only cooking for a couple of people, maybe hit up a friend and just like offer to give them the other half or somebody else who's cooking. They freeze really well, and if you like to bake, you could do, you do like a sweet potato cranberry quick bread or a pumpkin quick bread with cranberries. I'll share some ideas for ways to use leftovers too, but Thanksgiving, and especially this Thanksgiving, is a good time of year to kind of like have a partner in crime, either a neighbor, a friend, a coworker, or someone from your WW meeting, if you're a Weight Watchers member, and just split ingredients so you don't wind up with too many, or even take one makes one dish, one makes the other, and you guys just share. It's just a thought for you. Ooh. Ooh, that sounds delicious. Lisa just said she adds tropical fruit. I think mango would be really yummy if you wanted to kind of like 
give your Thanksgiving that wouldn't, we could all probably use a trip to a, a nice island at this point, right? So having some mango and cranberry sauce sounds really great. So to make your fresh cranberry chutney, what I love about this, you don't have to use a lot of sugar. You're just gonna take an equal part fresh cranberry and then either diced fresh apple. If it's got a red peel, you can go ahead and leave the peel on. If you wanna peel it, you can. Dice that up and add it in. You could also do the same thing with orange, depending on the vibe you want. And then you're just going to take your mini chop. I'm not gonna do it here on you guys because it's gonna be so loud. You just pulse it a bunch of times, like not a lot. It might take four or five times. This guy has the um, pulse on the top. Another one, it might be on the bottom. If you have an immersion blender, you could also use that. Just make sure the one thing with these put it in a tall like glass or a taller container because it will turn into like a helicopter that spatters whatever you're cooking from your pan and, and whatnot all over you. But you just wanna get like a, a fine chop here. And then I made some the other day, um, actually when I took the picture that I put in our, the email I sent you last week with the sheet pan dinner and the cranberry chutney, um, I only had to add two teaspoons of sugar to get it to that like sweet tart flavor that I wanted. And by keeping the cranberries raw, you're getting more antioxidants. It's just better for you all together. And it's really, really easy to make a tiny amount like this. If you wanted to give it a little extra flavor, something fun, you could add some fresh ginger to it or another hack that I love. And I'm gonna show you guys this gadget. I'm like, really, I, maybe I am talking more about gadgets than I intended to, but you might've heard me talk about these in my other videos and TV segments and things. It's a microplane grater or a, a RASP, R-A-S-P. I'll show you why I love these. Uh, first of all, if you're cooking with raw garlic, I love garlic, you could just take the clove and run it over the top of this guy, take the whole clove that's peeled and tap it into your pan or into whatever you're cooking and it comes out perfectly minced. You're not sitting there, you don't have a cutting board and a knife to clean. For your cranberry sauce, if you did the orange version, and this is a great garnish for your sweet potatoes and other dishes too, by the way, you can also use this, I'll show you here on my counter, to mince, whoop, it's falling off. Can you guys see that? To mince orange zest. So that would be so delicious on your sweet potatoes with just a little bit of parsley. It would also be really delicious to add like that bright orange cranberry New England vibe to your fresh cranberry. All right, I think we're good. <laughs> Can you check? It looks like, um, yes. Sorry about that, you guys. Oh my gosh, we just had to switch our camera battery. And I'm sorry I kept you a whole hour, but I hope I'm giving you some good easy tips. I also love using this for lemon zest in chicken soup and dips in lots of things to marinate your chicken breasts or your turkey breasts. You can use lime zest in any Mexican dish. It's so delicious. I use this for Parmesan cheese to get it all fluffy and pillowy. You don't have to use as much and a great chocolate on top of things too, if you just want a little burst of chocolate. So when it comes to desserts, I know I've shared them over and over and I can reshare them if you want. And this is what I'm making for Thanksgiving next week. I'm gonna do a mix of those little mini muffin tin apple pies and mini pumpkin pies. So you can just use half a can of pumpkin and follow the regular recipe to make pumpkin pie, but just bake them in the muffin tin. So you can have like a little bit of both, which for me is a classic thing for Thanksgiving. But I also have a really great recipe for people that aren't pie fans. It's a mini dark chocolate tart that you make with phyllo cups from your grocer's freezer. And they take like 10 minutes to make. I'm gonna show you the phyllo cups. They're right here in my freezer. Give me one second. I hit Wegmans, but every brand makes these. I think even Trader Joe's has them. Uh, Athena's maybe makes them. They're pre-baked, they look adorable. And it's really easy to make just a small batch amount of these dark chocolate tarts. And they would be so much fun to make and then bring to, the, bring to your neighbor or a friend who's also celebrating Thanksgiving on their own, or maybe invite people over to hang out with you like on your deck or by the fire pit, like after dinner, have a glass of wine, have a little bit of dessert. Like, I think we all need to get creative this year with ways to honor the tradition and still have fun, be super safe, but reach out to people who are lonely. And if you can see them in a safe way, great. And I promised you a really fun little cocktail garnish tip. Okay, we were talking about the herbs and ways to use them. This is one of my favorites. I hope it stays together here. 
you could take your fresh cranberries and skewer them on a sprig of rosemary like this and just lay it across your cocktail, whatever it is you're making or, um, you know, your white wine or your seltzer if you're not imbibing this Thanksgiving. And it's just a fun little festive garnish that's really easy to make. And I do think that no matter how you're celebrating, you should take a little time to make it special for yourself because you definitely deserve it. Um, okay, I went on and on and on, you guys. So I would love to hear in the chat, if you don't mind, like any questions or any dishes I didn't cover that you were hoping I would talk about. Or oh, the recipe? Yeah. Um, you know what? I can have Brian look that up and drop the link in the chat for you guys. It's on my website. You guys probably know it's cookingwjulie.com. Um, so you can find lots of great recipes there. It's, uh, it's called dark chocolate tart. Brian, it might say sea salt. I like to do them. You can top them with things like sea salt for that sweet and salty vibe. You can do uh, crushed peppermint candies if you want like a chocolate candy cane kind of a flavor. You could put little raspberries on top of them. They come out really, really adorable. So Brian's gonna find the recipe and put the link in the chat for you guys. Okay, I would also really, really love it if you let me know, um, helpful, Julie, not so helpful. I'd love more of this, less of that. Thanksgiving is like a, a specific sort of holiday to be talking about with so many different dishes, but something that I'd like to do for you when I did that survey and thank you to everybody who filled it out. I really, really appreciate it. Cause it's hard for me to know what would help you the most. Something I'd like to pi like pioneer with you guys or play with is having me send you a shop list um, that I'll shop for too, of like a handful of ingredients that we can get together live in an event like this and prep together for an hour to get you set up to make meals for the week. So not like making meals in all the little containers, but just sort of cook once, maybe like take an hour on a Sunday or a Monday, and then use those different things in lots of different ways throughout the week. So that's, that's just an idea that I've been playing with. I'd love to hear what you guys think. Are there any other questions in the chat? No. Well, I again, I thank you so much for spending so much time with me today. And I really, really appreciate it. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving, however you're spending it. And always like say hi to me on Instagram at cooking w Julie, you have my email, shoot me an email. I always reply to you guys. I'd love to send you more ideas for next week. And I will talk to you guys soon. I'm going to say goodbye now.